Welcome to I Can Science That. Today we'll be sciencing perspective. If you're watching this, it's a safe bet that you already have a pretty good handle on perspective. Or at least, you think you do. Sure, things in the distance look smaller. Perspective. Yeah, but can you tell me exactly how much smaller? Can you draw me an accurate diagram? Do you know an equation? Better yet, can you tell me why? Why do objects in the distance look smaller? If you've ever wondered what the cause behind perspective is, or maybe it's never occurred to you, but now that I mention it, that's a very good question. Exactly why do things look smaller in the distance? Well, stay tuned, because I'm about to science that. Previously, I made a video investigating perspective from a purely experimental direction. This time, I plan to derive perspective from basic principles. A lot of people seem to treat perspective as a fundamental, possibly mysterious, law of nature. But actually, perspective is the natural outcome of two simple principles. First, vision can only occur when light hits your eyes. And second, light typically travels in straight lines. I'm not planning to prove these properties in this video. For the purposes of this video, I'm taking both of these simple principles as given. If you're not already aware of these principles, I suggest you pause this video for now and go research those first. If you decide that maybe these principles are incorrect, come on back and leave a comment. I'm always open to discussion and respectful debate. Before we go any further though, I would like to clarify that second point there, because I anticipate that could get misinterpreted. Light doesn't always travel in straight lines. Sometimes light can bend, but that isn't what this video is about. This video is about perspective, and perspective is the result of light traveling in straight lines. If you see a phenomenon where light is bending, we don't call that perspective. That would be something else. To understand perspective, let's start with a simple point light source. This could be a star, or maybe it's a light twinkling on a Christmas tree. The point is, it's very small, and the light radiates out from it in all directions. Next, we want to see that light. In fact, let's take a picture of it. Right here, we'll put a photographic plate. Maybe this is a piece of film, or we could go digital and make it the CCD from a digital camera. The light coming from our Christmas tree goes in all directions, and one of those directions comes straight towards us. It hits the photographic plate right here, and we're hoping to get a nice picture of the light. But when we develop the film, that isn't what we get. You see, the light comes off our Christmas tree going in all directions, and that means it hits our photo film everywhere. That causes the entire film to get exposed. So instead of an image, we get a blurry smear of light over the entire picture. To solve this problem, we put our film into a box to block most of the light. We leave a tiny hole in the box right here to let only that little bit of light come in through the front. Now, the light going right through the hole leaves a dot on the film, but the light that would have exposed the rest of the film is blocked. This time, when we develop the film, we get a sharp little dot on it. Yeah, so what? So we've got a dot created by making a tiny hole in a box. To see why that's interesting, let's add another light. I'll put a red light up here on the top of the tree. Just like the blue one, the red light shines out in all directions, and we'll get one tiny beam that goes through the hole and hits our film right here. And let's put a little green light down here. The green light shines in all directions, and one little beam will go through the hole and hit the film right here. What makes this so exciting is that we've created a perfect little miniature image of the original three dots. If you're paying attention, you'll see that the image is upside down, but we got the three colored lights in a row, spaced just right, only upside down. Up till now, we've been talking about point light sources, but what about a whole tree? Well, this tree itself might not glow, but it does reflect light. Maybe the light from the sun is shining down on the tree, and each little needle scatters that light, mostly the green, in every direction. Some of that green light will hit our camera, and some brown light will get scattered back up from the trunk and hit our film up here. We'll end up with a nice little image of the entire tree. This is what's called a pinhole camera, and it works simply because the light travels in straight lines from the target and enters the camera. That's all we did to make this diagram. We drew straight lines where the light traveled. But this video isn't supposed to be about cameras. 
What does any of this have to do with perspective? Indeed, I don't want to get into cameras and optics in this video. What I want you to notice is that we've created a perspective diagram right here, and we did it by sticking to those two simple principles. Light must enter your eye, or camera, to be seen. And the light moved in straight lines to get there. We didn't even need any math yet, but I did promise you formulas, so let's explore this diagram and see if we can change this from an abstract drawing into some equations. First, let's clean it up. I'll get rid of the trees. Here we have the height of the original object, h, and the distance from the pinhole back to the object, which we call d. And let's call the distance from the pinhole back to the film, f. And finally, let me call the height of the image on the film h prime. These crossing lines here create a pair of similar triangles. Since these triangles are similar, meaning they have the same angles, that means they have the same ratio of base to height, like this. So maybe we'd ask the question, how big will our picture of the tree turn out? A quick rearrange shows us that the size of the image on the film is the height of the original tree divided by the distance to the tree multiplied by f. That f says we can zoom the image in and out by moving the film back and forth in the camera. Again, I don't want to get into optics in this video, but when a photographer talks about zoom, they use the term focal length. This is a decent illustration of sort of what they're talking about. So from this we can see that the size of an image is inversely proportional to the distance to the object. That gives us the basic formula for perspective right there. And again, all it took to get this was the idea that light generally travels in straight lines. Usually, when you see the perspective diagram, it's done with objects in front of the camera. After all, the camera makes objects upside down, and we don't want that. Usually, you see something like this, with a tall object in the background and something smaller in the foreground. In this version of the diagram, we once again have similar triangles. The edges of these triangles exist because the light from the trees is traveling in straight lines. And the result is the same equation relating the size and distances of the objects. These two trees look to be the same height. They'll make images on the film that are the same size, so they look the same size, even though we know they aren't the same size. It's just perspective. For example, a six inch action figure two feet from the camera looks like a six foot man 24 feet from the camera. I'll put a link to this artist's brilliant work with forced perspective into the description. Now I know that math makes some people uneasy. You might be suspicious of this. All I've done is draw light traveling in straight lines, but you want to be sure I'm not tricking you. I encourage you to perform a simple experiment like this one. I'll put a link to my previous video in the description. Give that a watch, but better than that, go and try it for yourself. Check it out to see if this simple formula holds up. When you do an experiment like that one, you'll probably have a slightly different picture. Instead of a small object up close and a tall one in the back, you'll probably have a row of objects all the same size. Let's see how our math can be used with a situation like that. Here I've placed two identical trees at different distances from the camera. If we take a picture of these trees, we'll get an image that looks like this. Tree number one, shown with the red line, makes an image h1 prime tall. Tree number two is closer, and the green line shows that it will come out h2 prime tall. We aren't going to get similar triangles this time, so no help there. Instead, let's go back to the formula we came up with already. h prime equals f times h over d. That should still hold true for each of our trees individually, and that gives us equations for h1 prime and h2 prime. To compare the apparent heights of the trees, let's take them as a ratio. h2 prime over h1 prime. That's right here. F is the same for both, so let's cancel that out. And since both trees are actually the same height, the h's will cancel too. Finally, we're left with this equation again. The apparent size of an object is inversely proportional to its distance from the viewer. Why? Because light generally travels in straight lines, and the light has to get to your eye for you to see it. So that's pretty much perspective right there, proven with nothing more than straight lines converging to a point. But I haven't talked about angular size yet. So what's the deal with angular size? The equations I've shown so far come in two forms. Both equations show an inverse relationship between apparent height and distance. Either the apparent height of an image depends on the focal length of the camera, 
or the apparent height of two objects can be compared against each other. Neither of these is especially useful to an astronomer. An astronomer might want to ask something like, how big does the moon look? Or how far apart are those two stars? With these equations, the best we could do is to say how big the moon would be with a particular camera or telescope. What we want is a way to describe the size of an object that's the same for every observer, regardless of their optics. Looking back at our diagrams, we can see that these angles I've called alpha 1 and alpha 2 do not depend on any of the optics. The lines in these diagrams still depend on the heights of the objects and the distance to the viewer, but we've eliminated the focal length as a variable. That means these angles will be the same for any viewer, regardless of what camera they use or what zoom setting they have. Let's pause on that a moment. How can the view be the same no matter what zoom setting I choose? Good question. I don't want to leave you with that impression. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is the angular size of an object does not depend on the zoom level. The angular size is something that can be repeatedly measured, but it doesn't quite tell us how big something is going to look. Looking at the moon through a telescope will make it look bigger, but that doesn't change the angular size. A full circle is still 360 degrees. If you zoom into a section of the circle 10 degrees wide, the section will look bigger, but it's still 10 degrees. That's angular size. So in this diagram, the faraway tree has an angular size of alpha 1, and the nearby tree is alpha 2. Let's do a little math for this. If you remember your trigonometry, or if you don't, the tangent is opposite over adjacent. In our diagram, that's h over d. To get the angle, we use the inverse tangent or arc tangent. You may see that written this way, or as arc tan, or sometimes a tan. So that gives us a simple equation to describe the angular size of an object given its distance from the viewer. There's plenty more to dig into here. We haven't talked about vanishing points. We didn't get into how camera lenses work, and we didn't cover this projection matrix thing. But we did show what causes perspective and how it works. As long as the light is traveling in straight lines, it's simple to draw a diagram like this, and you can apply these formulas to evaluate claims on your own. You'll see people claiming that the curve of these power lines is just perspective. We know better. This is certainly a genuine observation. The link is in the description. This really does happen, and I'll let you try to figure out what causes this on your own, but it's definitely not perspective doing that. If you go looking, you can find people who will claim that the sun doesn't obey perspective for some reason. But you know that all you have to do is trace the direction of the light to see what it should look like. You'll find people claiming that a proper perspective diagram looks like this. But we can check it. They might even claim that an object can go past the vanishing point. But that isn't right, is it? Maybe if they drew those lines as curves, Showing the inverse relationship of an object's apparent height versus distance, that might be a useful diagram, but that isn't what they drew here, so we know they've made a mistake. And that brings us to the end of the video, where I want to try a little something new. I'm going to wrap up with some preemptive rebuttal. I'm going to try to anticipate what I think some criticisms of this video are going to be and answer those right here, just to try to speed the conversation along a little. Right off, I might expect somebody to take exception with my two starting principles. I remember when I first learned how vision works. I distinctly remember that I thought vision was something coming out of your eyes. If anyone out there is still thinking that, I'll just suggest you think about how a pinhole camera works. Surely that won't be shooting rays out of it, and there's no need for your eyes to do that either. Second, light doesn't always travel in straight lines. I've mentioned this before, light does refract. And when that is happening, we call that effect refraction, and that's different from perspective. Let's be careful not to mix those two together as if they were the same thing. Next, I've become aware that there's a whole category of folks out there in YouTube land who have decided to disavow the use of orthographic views like these. Their claim is that since the view is not drawn in perspective, it's somehow dishonest. An orthographic view isn't meant to show what objects look like in the distance. It's meant to show how big the objects actually are. And from there, we'll derive perspective to calculate how big the objects will look. Think of an orthographic view as a graph 
plotting the actual height of objects versus the distance from the viewer. We know that the actual height doesn't change as objects get further away, so our graph of the actual heights of the objects won't include perspective. They'd like you to believe that this is an accurate portrayal of how an object should look, but that isn't correct at all. If you want to show a graph of the apparent height of an object versus distance, it doesn't look like that. It looks like this. I don't mind if you want to show that diagram, as long as you get it right. Finally, there's a group of people who talk about something they call compression. The word compression is something photographers use to describe an effective perspective. Here's a great video explaining what that word really means in terms of perspective. Link in the description. But somebody seems to have co-opted this word to mean something else. Something that I haven't found any definition for, but at any rate, it's certainly not anything caused by perspective. And I think that really sums up a lot of what I'm talking about in this video. There are tons of people out there throwing words around like perspective and compression. As Inigo Montoya so wisely said, You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means.